Ed Bernstein. A few months ago, um, my knee was really bothering me. I couldn't walk up steps. Um, I've been very active my entire life. I was really kind of depressed thinking of how bad my knee was, thinking I needed a knee replacement or something like that. So I went in to see an orthopedic surgeon, uh, Dr. Matt Otten, Matthew Otten, and, um, and he gave me something called PRP. And with me today is Dr. Matt, is it Matt or Matthew? Matthew, or Matt, whatever, <laughs> totally fine. Uh, so Dr. Otten, when, when I came to see you, and you did some examinations, just some ultrasound, things like that, and you made a decision that something called PRP would be helpful to me. What is PRP? So PRP's been around for about 20 years or so, and it's become very popular in the last 10 years. Basically what it is is you take your platelets, which are the body's first line of defense in any sort of injury, and you re-inject, so you concentrate your platelets and re-inject them back into a site of injury. And a lot of patients are doing this now for arthritic conditions. Right. Okay, now let me put that in layman's terms. Sure. You took some blood. Yes. <laughs> yes. You took some blood out of my arm. The nurse disappeared with a couple of vials of blood. Correct. She went into a different room, put them into a machine, a centrifuge, or what was That's that That's correct, a centrifuge, centrifuge to isolate the platelets. Right. And I guess it spins uh, the blood somehow and separates out the platelets from the blood. That's correct. Right. And then... Um, and then uh, you came in, you took the, the platelets. Correct. And, um, and injected them and into my knee Correct. using um, some ultrasound to guide you, at least initially, so you knew exactly where you were going. And the whole process, I mean, other than waiting for the blood to spin, it's just, you know, you could be in and out in 20 minutes. Yeah, it, it really takes about an hour if you look mm -hmm. at it. Right. Um, about 45 minutes to an hour. And basically the procedure itself takes a couple minutes, just like right. you said. But it's preparing the blood and doing it properly. That's what actually takes the time. But it's about an hour. Mm -hmm. And what we've always used historically in medicine is cortisone or something called hyaluronic acids. Hyaluronic acids are an injectable series that you do in your knees in America. Outside the U.S., you can do it in any sort of joint, uh, specifically an articular joint, but in America, it's only used for the knees. And hyaluronic acids only last about four to six months before they begin to wear off. Mm -hmm. Whereas PRP can last upwards of a year to two years and potentially three years for early to moderate arthritic conditions. And how, how does PRP work once it's the, the plasma is injected into your into your joint. So there's a couple different things here, and this is the way I usually like to describe it. There's three or four major things that happen. Number one, alpha granules are released once the platelets are activated. Alpha granules are basically the body's smoke signal. Number two, once the platelets are activated, they form fibrin crosslinks, basically a heart attack. It's the same concept as a heart attack. Those fibrin crosslinks are basically a scaffolding for new tissue to form. The third thing they do is produce a chemical called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. That's a big word. Basically, it's your body's own cortisone. So essentially, this is helping your body repair itself? Am I Repair itself. That? And, and so it does two things. One, it rep helps repair itself. The second thing it does is, is potentially, in most patients, there's a subselect patient, there's a subselect group of patients that this doesn't work in, maybe two to five percent. But if, if you produce a chemical called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, it's a potent, long-term anti-inflammatory. So it continues to work? It does. It continues to work for about a year. Mm -hmm. After a year, you basically know what you get. I usually do a series of three injections spaced out about a week apart for a major joint. So there's two interesting studies that have come out. The first one was a large study done in Europe um, where we compared hyaluronic acids, which is the conventional medicine that we use in everyday medicine that's covered by insurance and it's been proven to be effective. Hyaluronic acids, you do the series of three injections, one a week for three weeks, and you inject it into the knee. So we did a head-to-head -head study with hyaluronic acid, the conventional medicine, versus PRP, a series of three injections for both products. The patients that had the PRP were much happier 
and much more pain-free at the end of one year. And that study has actually just been replicated here in the United States by a gentleman out of Chicago by the name of Brian Cole. And so now there's two major studies that have been performed that show the efficacy and the potential new field of medicine that has that has arisen from this over the past few years. See, and I can attest to that because after my first injection, I, I would say my knee was somewhere between 50 or 70 percent better, mm -hmm. in, you know, within the first few days. Mm -hmm. um, then by the time we had finished a third injection, I was 85, 90 percent better and, you know, kind of like, look, I'm much older than I used to be and have wear and tear on my, my joints. but. Um, but, I mean, the relief has been incredible. And, I, and I have had um, steroid shots in the past, and these are much more effective. They're much more effective, and they're not damaging to tissue. So the other thing that we're doing in medicine, too, specifically regenerative orthopedics, which is the field of stem cells, PRP, et cetera, um, the cortisone is actually degradative to your joint. It, it produces a chemical that is actually something what we call chondrolytic, so a joint is covered by something called articular cartilage. I always describe it as a sheet of ice on top of the pavement. That sheet of ice is the articular cartilage. Mm -hmm. And that's the stuff that makes your joints glide. That is also the stuff that begins to wear down over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so this stuff, PRP, stem cells, or any of the other regenerative orthopedic interventions, does not wear down the articular cartilage, whereas cortisone does. So there's a big push in medicine, uh, specifically orthopedics, to get away from cortisone and to move into a different field, something that has anti-inflammatory effects and healing properties. That's exactly what you had done, Ed. Yeah. Now, you mentioned stem cell. Mm -hmm. um, it's a similar but different process? It's kind of a different beast all amongst itself. Okay. Um, stem cells, you're at, so, Platelet-rich plasma therapy, or PRP, will call in the stem cells. The alpha granules that are released from the platelets actually have little signals, chemical signals, to call in the stem cells. Whereas when you do a stem cell procedure, A, it takes a lot longer. It's about a two hour long procedure here in the United States. Um, and B, uh, you're actually transplanting stem cells. And there's two places you can get stem cells from. The first of which is your bone marrow. The second of which is your fat, believe it or not. Fat or adipose tissue is extremely rich in stem cells. You can actually harvest anywhere between 250 to 500 million stem cells per procedure. And basically what we've learned is if you take fat or bone marrow, isolate the stem cells, re-inject it into a site of injury, it has significant improvement both short term and long term. So where do you typically um, take the fat from? Uh, I prefer abdominal fat. It tends okay. to be a little richer. Um, you probably wouldn't be the best candidate. <laughs> no, actually. I don't know. I have some of that. <laughs> um, I prefer abdominal yeah. fat, but you can actually get fat from anywhere as long uh -huh. as it's your own fat. Is one more effect? Is the bone mar marrow uh, more effective than? There's a fat point of contention yeah. with this, and there's arguments on both sides. I've been doing this now for about 10 years, and I've been specifically interested in regenerative orthopedics for about 10 years. In my personal anecdotal clinical experience, so that is to say, real life, <laughs> real life in my <laughs> clinic, yeah. um, I tend to have much better results with fat. The yield of stem cells when you harvest either bone marrow or fat, the yield of stem cells is much higher from fat. And, and why is and, and what is the, the the technique? How does the technique differ? I mean, you still w take the fat. I mean, obviously, it's not taking blood; it's it's taking fat cells. Much is that a little bit more painful? Or believe it or not, so I just did this on my father actually. Uh -huh. So I, I'll use him as as an example because he won't mind if I discuss his particular case with regards to HIPAA violations. Um, my dad was a little bit nervous. I had told him about doing this for about two or three months before I actually flew him down and did this on him. Um, after it was all said and done, he, was, he looked at me and said, you know, Matt, that was not that bad. Mm -hmm. I always walk patients, including my dad, I always walk patients through it and I'll stop at any point in time if they have significant pain. But it's 
All told, it's really not that bad. And the worst part of the procedure is, is extracting the fat. You do a mini liposuction at the bedside, uh, and you numb up the abdominal fat with something called tumescent fluid, which is essentially what we use in plastic surgery. So the abdominal fat is numb, and it's also expanded, so you can pluck off the little, um, the little fat cells. I'll try and keep, it, uh -huh. I'll try and keep the words as, as simple as possible, but you can pluck off the little fat cells, uh, and it's not that painful, believe it or not. You just use a local um, anesthesia Just a local in, anesthetic. In the belly. Local yeah. anesthetic. The incisions are extremely small. They're about one half centimeter to a centimeter. Right. The procedure itself with harvesting the fat takes about 20 minutes, mm -hmm. um, and it's very tolerable. And a lot more expensive than the PRP. It is, yeah. and that's because of the time and the equipment that's yeah. needed. So is it, makes, is it prudent to try the PRP first? I always recommend yeah. it. So I'm a, I'm a true believer in PRP and have been. I initially started doing this back in Detroit with my fellowship, which was with an NFL team. Mm -hmm. and they were kind of making that push towards moving right. away from cortisone because you're thinking about longevity with these guys with regards to their careers. The less, you could, the less harm you can do, the better off you are right. with these guys. So they don't want cortisone anymore. NFL athletes and a multitude of pro athletes have now figured this right. out. No cortisone for them. So I always recommend trying PRP first. And that's a twofold reason. Number one, because of the cost. It's cheap and it's usually effective. Number two, um, it, it, it usually has enough relief that you don't need to move on to a larger, more invasive, more expensive procedure for patients. Right. Now you mentioned uh, NFL and the team you're working with. Um, a lot of these injuries are athletic injuries, or, and some of them are arthritic with older guys like me. You know, you just you know, wear and tear. You can't avoid. I, I assume you can't avoid it. You can't. Right. I mean, the aging process. We can't stop the aging process. We haven't figured that out yet. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it also seems that um, in your profession, there's just so much more business with athletes, athletes, I mean, she, getting injured mm -hmm. um, than it was when I was growing up. I agree, and I think, that, I think the level of activity with most people these days has increased substantially. All of us want to be outside. All of us have recognized the benefits of, of being active and being healthy, mm -hmm. both the short-term and the long-term benefits of this stuff. Uh, and so we are seeing more and more athletically related injuries in day-to-day -day practice. I mean, I assume younger and younger um, patients. Absolutely. An interesting yeah. point with that is we now see patients that are 16, 17 years old that have developed some sort of repetitive injury. And that's because of this single sport uh, movement we've right. made in the United States. Because a lot of kids now play only one sport of sports. So we are now seeing that multi multitude of patients with repetitive repetitively caused injuries. Right. I know that uh, you personally are a big uh, surfer and skier. I mean, you're out, you're out there all the time on these. And both of them are, are pretty dangerous sports. I mean, skiing injuries are very typical. They are, especially the yeah. ACLs and knees. I, I, I try yeah. and practice what I preach, too. Um, I, I always tell my patients, be healthy, stay active, and, and I really try to practice what I preach in that sense, Which too. involves cross-training. Absolutely. I do a ton of different other things. I rock climb, I do yoga. Um, so you always need to cross-train. You know, even if you're an avid runner, I tell you, do something different a few days a week. You mm -hmm. don't want to you don't want to put yourself at risk for chronic repetitive injuries because those are the tough ones to fix. So let's talk about um, like a hip injury. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who's a marathon runner, needed a hip replacement. Mm -hmm. I was amazed, and he, I mean, he was out for you know down for a couple weeks with this hip replacement. Here it is, uh, six months, nine months later, he's running marathons again. Oh yeah. Hip replacements are, are, so with all the joint replacements that we have, hip are by far the best replacements that we have. Um, hip, we have the hip down pretty well at this point in time. 
But that being said, most a lot of patients these days are trying to avoid hip replacements because we're seeing more arthritis in younger and younger and younger patients. We're seeing patients that are coming in at 45, 55 that have horrific looking hips. Mm -hmm. And if you do a hip replacement on them now at this early of an age, you potentially are looking at a revision down the road. And so patients are looking for that bridge. What can buy me five, 10, 15 years? Right. And so that's why there's been a big push too for PRP as well as stem cells in the hip. And there's a bunch of different hip injuries. There's also something called femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, which is pretty recent in terms of medicine. It's a pretty recent diagnosis that we've developed. In the last 15 years, we've really recognized that there is an early condition that is most likely genetic called femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, which leaves you prone to arthritis early earlier in mm -hmm. age and so we're trying to intervene on patients such as that. Is there a way to intervene um, non-surgically? I mean the stuff like a leave and things like that, anti-inflammatories, ice, I mean do they work? Cryotherapy? So I actually like cryotherapy. Uh -huh. Cryotherapy, there's, I believe it's interleukin-7. It, it inhibits or reduces the production of interleukin-7. Let's, let's, let's explain what cryotherapy is. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Cryotherapy is essentially going into an ultra-cooled uh, chamber. chamber. And I believe, you may know this better than I, but I believe it goes down to minus 100 Celsius, 150 Celsius, something. Minus. 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 Yes. Minus. It's, it's an unbelievably cold chamber. Yeah. You do it for about two or three minutes. Right. This actually started out, cryotherapy actually started out in Eastern Europe mm -hmm. with the uh, Olympic Committee in the Eastern Bloc. Um, it was also, it's also approved in Eastern Europe for its benefits with regards to insurance. It's approved for rheumatoid arthritis. It now has been popularized not only by the rugby teams by the UK, but now by a lot of professional athletes. So I love cold therapy. I mean, if, the philosophy being, you know, the first thing you do is you put some ice when, when something's swollen in your body, right? And believe it or not, yeah. if you ask anyone that's been around long enough in the business, ice is one of the best medicines we have. Amazing. Yeah. Cheap and effective. Right, so it, so you go for some cryotherapy or some ice treatment and it reduces the inflammation, thereby reducing the pain. But is, is it a permanent solution? It's not a permanent solution. It is a helpful solution is how uh -huh. I describe it, Management. but it's not a permanent. Yeah. The best way to do permanent solutions is cross training, taking care of yourself, and believe it or not, sleep. And I'll actually talk about that for just a second. Okay. Sleep is one of the most important things you can do. It is the most regenerative property that you can do in your body. When you go into the, your deepest sleep, called your delta waves, you actually have a spike in your, in your own growth hormone. Your growth hormone is the most regenerative is the most regenerative hormone in our body that our body produces. So sleep is absolutely crucial. And of course, a lot of people are taking growth hormone. They are. Right? They are. So growth hormone has been around for quite some time. Unfortunately, Sylvester Stallone kind of ruined that for a lot of people when he was caught flying overseas. And once Sylvester St Stallone was caught, there was a big FDA crackdown on growth hormone. That being said, there is some real benefits to growth hormone, I'm not going to lie, but the FDA uh -huh. does not approve it at this point in time, only for very, very specific problems. Right, so um, we talked about the, uh, the hip, we talked about the knee. Shoulder injuries are another big issue, particularly with athletes. I know that every, eventually every professional pitcher, mm -hmm. every quarterback, every s competitive swimmer, mm -hmm. you know, a tennis player, and maybe even volleyball player, as soon as you're involved in that overhead movement, Absolutely. Right, you're going to have eventually rotator issues. Absolutely. So, rotate, so the shoulder is composed of a couple different major components that get injured relatively frequently mm -hmm. and relatively easily. The first of which is the rotator cuff, which everyone's heard of. The second of which, and I'll use Andrew Luck as an example here, the quarterback from the Indianapolis Colts, um, labrum. There's a cartilage lining to the rim which helps give stability to the joint, and that's called a labrum. And that can tear off the bone quite easily in a lot of patients, either with forceful, with a forceful thrust superiorly, so up, 
back or forward. An accident or, an accident. or an acute uh, action that causes it. Absolutely. Right. And it's the same with the rotator cuff as well. That can either be A, chronic, with chronic wear and tear, just like you said, the overhead activities, or it could be a major event and a major injury, such as an accident or mm -hmm. such as a throwing accident um, or being tackled on the field or something of the sort. You can actually tear your rotator cuff. So there's a rotator cuff injury, there's a labrum injury, Usually there's a coexisting biceps tendonitis or a biceps injury where it passes through something called a groove up front in the, in the humerus. Um, the other thing that you have to think about with shoulders these days is arthritis. So th those are the major injuries with the shoulder. When you say these days, why is it different today than it was 40 years ago? It is, and this is, yeah. and this is because of the aging population that we're seeing. Uh -huh. It's the pig and the python description that, that I think a lot of people have heard about, where this, the baby boomers are now getting older and the baby boomers were a huge population group in our society. And these, pa and these people are now getting older and they're living longer. So we have a older population. Yeah, I, I know. I, my father would hurt his shoulder or a body part. He would he would just deal with it. You know, it was just okay. I can't move my arm. I won't move my arm. <laughs> you know, it's like it, it doesn't work for my generation. It does, and no one you know, wants you, to be that. No, way. you want it, you, you want to get it healed. You want yeah. to be active. You want to keep moving. So with the uh, rotator cuff, does something like PRP Absolutely. work on shoulder? So I always, a lot of patients will come in for chronic pain, specifically when you wake up at night. That's one of the most telltale signs mm -hmm. that this is a rotator cuff injury, is if you roll over or have to sleep a certain way and you have exquisite pain or pain that keeps you up at night, that's oftentimes a rotator cuff injury. And that the best way to diagnose that is with an MRI. Once the MRI has been found, once you've taken the MRI, you can go through the results. And if you have a part partial tear or high-grade tendinosis or tendinitis right. of the rotator cuff, PRP or stem cells is a very effective route of fixing the problem. In my personal experience in my clinic, I tend to have about an 80-85% success rate in most patients. Well, that, and yeah. Once again, it lasts a year? Or? Usually it can be a semi-permanent fix. Well. Um, most patients do not opt the surgical route. In my practice, they actually want PRP done in the shoulder. And I, again, I don't like doing cortisone in the shoulder that often. I'll do it once in a blue moon. Mm -hmm. But again, it thins the cartilage, it thins the tendon, and ultimately, um, if you do cortisones on a regular basis, it's not good for the rotator cuff or the body as, in general. So I love PRP. You have to put it in the right area. You have to identify what spot and what tendon, because there's four major tendons of the rotator cuff. You have to identify the actual source of pathology or injury and pain, and as long as you do that, you can inject it directly into that tendon, and you have to do that under some sort of imaging guidance. I personally like ultrasound to right. see the soft tissue. But you know, it's easy, it's painless, and not that expensive. It's not. Yeah, so what body parts can you use PRP? You the, the knee, the shoulder. I know that you did something for my daughter um, on her Achilles, Achilles tendon. tendon, which of all these procedures, I guess, is the most painful. Yeah, the Achilles and the patella yeah. tendon tend to be the most painful procedures yeah. anywhere in the body. Because the knee, the knee was not painful at all. Not at all. I mean, I mean, you, know, you, you take out when it actually, uh, you know, taking the blood out is just as painful as injecting it in. Absolutely. But, use, but you guys use a butterfly, so it's not that bad. No, I, you know, <laughs> I, I aim to yeah. reduce any source of pain in my clinic, honestly, because yeah. I hate getting shots myself, and so yeah. I've always, I've always been very gentle with my injections okay. but you can do it anywhere any any anywhere in the body because yeah. it's your own body stuff all mm -hmm. I'm doing is re-injecting concentrated platelets or your own stem cells back into a pain source or an injured tendon mm -hmm. or an injured ligament or a joint mm -hmm. hand wrist hand wrist elbow shoulder we're doing it in the spine now this is kind of the latest thing mm -hmm. a lot of spine surgeons now are again moving away in from the cortisone mm -hmm. so we're doing it in the back as well there's some great studies out of HSS hospital Hospital for Special Surgery with Greg Lutz, mm -hmm. L-U-T-Z, If in case anyone listening would like to look that up. Mm -hmm. He has some amazing results in the spine. Well, uh, okay, we talked about the shoulder, the hip, the knee, arthritis. Okay, is there any way to avoid it and, um, and 
can you live on Aleve and Advil? Okay, I hate NSAIDs. Aleve and Advil and ibuprofen and are a class of medications called NSAIDs. Mm -hmm. NSAIDs. The problem with living on NSAIDs or living on Aleve or, or uh, ibuprofen is it affects the kidneys in a negative right. way. So I am not a major proponent of living on these medications. A lot of patients now have learned the benefits of something called turmeric, which is essentially the root. Mm -hmm. uh, turmeric actually works through a co COX-2 in inhibition, which is essentially a Celebrex. And there's good clinical data that turmeric is highly effective. In fact, in a lot of clinical studies, it's actually beaten out Celebrex. So you you go won't to, see that published much. Right. So. Like, so if you just go to a health food store? Totally. And totally. Go to Costco. It's cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and buy turmeric. And buy turmeric pills. And they, it comes in pill form. Cause yeah, but it's, it's a longer term uh, solution, I would think. It is a right? much longer term. The other yeah. thing is to avoid arthritis or avoid mm -hmm. the progression of arthritis, a body in motion wants to stay in motion. You have to move. You have to move a lot. And it's the opposite joints. of what people think. Yeah. Right? They're sore, they're in pain. The last thing they want to do is move. And you're saying it's move. The worst thing to do is not move. Non mobilizing right. non mobilization of a joint is the worst thing that you can do. You have to move a joint. Motion in a joint allows the healing properties and the blood to penetrate the joint and and help heal the joint. So you have to move. But you have to move a, a certain way. I mean, you don't over uh, extend yourself where you actually exasperate the injury. That's correct. Yeah. All within reason. Yeah, so uh, so these are, it's important to, you know, go speak to your um, physician, your orthopedic doctor, or, or, your, or your physical therapist to find mm -hmm. out what type of activities are, are healing in that regard. Mm -hmm. Hey, well, this PRP, I can attest uh, firsthand. It worked for me, so um, before people you go under the knife or do something else, uh, try it and see if it works. Well, I think the best, I, I, I've recently utilized my dad as an example, yeah. too. My dad is a total knee replacement candidate. He's 84 years old, right. and so I've done this on him, and he's had very good results, too. And if I do it on my dad, you know I believe in it, and you know it's it's effective. Okay. Your dad's lucky to have an orthopedic surgeon as a son. <laughs> I, get, I just like going fishing with him. That's all right. I'll say. So thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Matthew Otten. Where do we find you? We you can find me at Advanced Orthopedics and Sports Medicine here in town. Thank you. See you next week. There are many types of careless drivers. Those who text and drive, drink and drive, and those distracted drivers. If you've been hurt, you need to call me. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com.